Thank you. Good to go. Thank you. So uh, Sally, Bob, and I had, had spoke a couple weeks ago when this all kind of broke and we started talking. Uh, we had had some plans to really focus on some, some workshops that would help chamber members uh, grow their business, grow their revenue, and kind of position themselves. And that was all good and well until uh, a virus showed up. And so now our world has kind of changed. And so what Bob and Sally and I spoke about is trying to find some quick ways for businesses to find revenue in a crisis. And so I'll just give you a little bit of background, Sally, um, and for your, for your members. In 2000 and 2008, I worked through the recession uh, in, in a different capacity, but I had the ability to sit with business owners and I was privy to their financial statements. And what I, what I found is that you would have a comp two companies that did the same thing, maybe in the same area, and one was thriving while the other was just surviving or maybe not surviving and even going through the recession and, and pre and post recession. And there were some characteristics that came out and there's many different things that those business owners that really did a difference. But the focus for today is really around the sales piece. So there's, there's many ways to garner revenue in a recession or even post recession, but we're going to focus today a little bit on uh, finding revenue quickly and finding ways to position yourself. So when this tide does turn, then, then we have the ability to um, kind of capitalize on it. Sally, does that still sound like, a good plan yeah, today? That's the plan. I think we'll have some other questions that will pop in, but yeah, let's get started. Yeah, so what we'll do is I'll jump into the three strategies and then we'll ask questions after that. But, but really, first and foremost, when I look at the organizations that were able to find revenues, those that really survived in, in 2008, the first strategy that they had was to increase the visibility with their customers, their prospects, and their employees. Now, although that seems like a very simple idea right now, there's a powerful way in which you can start to find revenue real quick by doubling up the efforts that you of speaking to your customers and prospects, and especially employees. Now, that takes, uh, obviously, as we know, that takes a little different spin today because we can't physically go out to them like we did in 2008. So here we are, you know, virtual, but we're doing it. And I can see in, in 2008, this was a strategy the businesses that not only thrived through the recession, but then went on to have better performance. This was one of their main core strategies, and I see that happening today. What I want you to think about with this, what seems like a very simple idea, is when you're doubling down talking to your great customers and your prospects, what you want to think of this now is more of a filter that you're going to use in order to potentially reinvent yourself or to find revenue. So a lot of times what we find is when we're going out to our customers and our prospects and we're asking them this simple question, we're asking them, what, what is the one or two initiatives that you have today that you're facing that you didn't a month ago or two months ago? Or what problems are you trying to solve? <clears throat> Excuse me. And, and there's a lot of power in that because what comes out of those conversations, it gives us as businesses the opportunity to find revenue or to be able to possibly reinvent ourselves. And so we, as, as a, we can't find new revenue and we can't reinvent ourselves if we're trying to answer questions to old problems. And so one of the strategies that you can think about inside of this is how do you as the leader or how do you engage your sales staff to be able to go out and double up on the conversation again with the idea of trying to solve a problem. It's kind of funny when you think about it, now we all hear it we hear it all the time. Uh, the stories are coming through. I mean, you've got GM and Ford now are, are building ventilators. You've got Bacardi is making a hand sanitizer. And, and although there's a, there's a patriotic component to that and a necessity to it, those businesses have capital, but it does tell you that they're able to reinvent themselves and find different ways to do things. We, as small to mid-sized businesses, we have the ability to reinvent ourselves. I was just taking the uh, dog for a walk a couple, three, four days ago, and I'm thinking while I'm walking him, I'm like, I'm paying for a gym membership that I never use, right? Or that I'm not able to go use. And then I realized, I think jokingly, Sally, I said, well, that hasn't changed in two years, right? I've been paying for it, right? But what was interesting is my first thought was cancel, right? Why, why do I need to pay for a gym membership for the next two or three months while this is maybe going on? And I get an email from them. And they say that they have sent out now links to all their members where they've done workouts of the day that we can do from home, just on your iPad, your laptop. 
but when you when you go out and you and you talk to your customers and your prospects really hard what you're able to do is help them solve a problem this is what i want everybody to capture is that you can start to solve a problem for them that didn't exist two months ago and a lot of times you can find some great revenue in there you have um, you have companies that are reinventing the way they're doing business which will help forward them in the future I just had Cox out to fix my internet this weekend. It was down. Of course, my boys were going crazy. You know, you thought, you thought that was the end of the world. And, but they don't even come in now, right? And so they're reinventing. So here's a guy standing outside of my house, yelling down the hallway, teaching a guy like me how to fix it. And you start to think about how, how businesses are reinventing themselves and how they're trying to solve problems. But right now, your prime customers have problems out there they're not they don't know how to solve and if you become the solution for it it can mean big things you can find some quick revenue there's an interesting i'll share this uh harvard business re, uh, research or it's been a while since i read it but they looked at recessions and they looked at the 1980 recession the 1990 slowdown and they looked at the 2000 dot com bust this was fascinating and it's been a long time since i read it but what i remember in it is that in, uh, companies that, that they, they looked at, the 4,700 companies that they looked at three years prior to the recessions, during the recessions, and then four years after. What they found is that companies that went out and just cut expenses, just slashed, fired, you know, just did those types, only 11% of those, if I remember, returned back to their glory post-recession. What they also found is that is that companies that just went out and said, look, we're not going to cut, we're going to grow, we're going we're gonna to pour money into marketing, and we're going to double up, and we're going to take these opportunities and these chances. They didn't protect their core business. They tried to do all these new things. The interesting thing, if I remember, it was, it was only like 15 to 16% return to glory. So what is really the answer? The answer, of course, is the balance. And what they found is that companies that really focused on operational efficiencies, finding revenue or expenses that really aren't being idle and then using that money to develop new markets by talking to their customers almost 40 percent of those return to their previous glory so think about that when we're trying to develop new markets and we're trying to find new revenue the easiest way folks that i consult clients on is talk to your customers about what their problems are and that's where it really makes a big difference your target, um, one of the things I tell businesses right now, so now you're sending your sales staff out. First of all, with your clients um, and, and prospects, one of the easiest ways to look for revenue is to look at your best competitors and find their second tier clients. They're set, their clients that the, the, of your competitors that are maybe their second tier that they're not paying attention that are up and coming. Those are fantastic ways to start picking those off. You can also target some of your weaker clients and you can look at some of their best, or excuse me, your weakest competitors and start looking at their best clients. And this is an initiative that a lot of those organizations in 2008, they went out and they had a list of the target people that they wanted and they went after those. And it's a fast way to start finding revenue by talking to your customer and solving a problem. Let me jump to the, uh, the next strategy because I wanna make sure we have time for questions. This is one that I'm fond of, and I talk to businesses about a lot. And this is one where you can start to pick up revenue right away. And this is review your sales pipeline right now for leakage. And what we're looking for is we're trying to mine opportunities. So hopefully all of you as business owners have some type of CRM, some type of customer relationship manager that you track all of your clients. And you, and you have in that your pipeline of things that are going forward. So there's two strategies I want you to think about. First, you wanna look at the deals that are going forward right away. Those are ones where you can try to move them up. Can you enhance the deal, those types of things. Here's what I found in 2000, I found in 2008, and I'm finding that now in 2000, uh, 2020 now, is that businesses in a recession do not actually spend less by and large, they just spend more cautiously. They don't necessarily spend less, they just spend more cautiously. So this is the time to be able to look at the deals in your pipeline. And this is what I'm doing. I'm, I'm going through the same thing a lot of you are, is I'm looking at deals going forward and saying, what? there we go, cool, thank you. 
So what we want to do, one of the, the easiest ways, and I saw a lot of organizations do this in 2008, and again, some of them right now that are having some real wins, is take your pipeline and go backwards. Go backwards of the deals that you lost. So depending on how long your sales cycle is, you know, that you may go back six months, 12 months, or even two years. I mean, my selling cycle is probably a year and a half. So really looking back uh, on those deals you lost. And here's the power. Here's where companies really saw some big hits in this. These are individuals that you went to the five, the four, or maybe even the three yard line, right? You, were, you thought you were going to score the touchdown, win the deal. You had rapport with them, but for some other reason, someone else won the deal. And, and in 2008, I saw a lot of growth from this by reaching back to those deals that you lost. And again, tying the first strategy with this one and reaching back to those individuals that you had that rapport with and simply just saying to them, look, the problem, uh, the problem that you had two months ago that I was unable to get may have changed. What are your problems that you're facing today? And you would be surprised at what people will start to tell you and what people will start to come up with and ways in which you can start to solve problems. So I'll give you a real story. I'm working with, uh, uh, working with a, a young lady, uh, a, a business that ran in the same thing. Everything just kind of stopped for her. And so two weeks ago, or about a week and a half ago, we did this strategy. I said, pull your, pull your five top prospects that you have out of deals you lost, deals you, that you went all the way to the five yard line and just didn't win, as an example, and call them. And, and, and talk to them about, hey, I know I didn't, couldn't help you with the problem you had before, but what are the one or two initiatives or things that you're facing right now? What could I maybe help you with now? And here's what was fascinating. She called me back. This would have been on Monday. Yeah, today's Tuesday, Wednesday. She calls me on Monday morning, and she says, you're not going to believe it. I called all five of them. All five of them had planned to defer the project that they lost to a later date. You know, like a lot of businesses, maybe kicking the can down the road a little bit. But what she said was interesting, and this is what I want you all to grab from the first strategy and the second strategy, is that all five of those, of all five of those, none of the winning people, the winning company, have even contacted them yet. Think about that. Think about it. She lost the deal, and she's reaching out and saying, look, that was a problem. You know, are they working with you on today's problems? And the answer, all five of them were no. And there is a golden opportunity. Think When you think about it, this is what excites me because I saw companies do this in 2008. And when they came out of it, they came out stronger. She calls me back and she says, this is, this is amazing. She goes, one of the five, what they did is they allocated the money that they were going to do that they're kicking down the road and they're solving a problem. She's solving a problem for them today. She's finding revenue in something that wasn't a problem today or there's a problem today that wasn't when she lost the deal two, three, four months ago. And think about the rapport that you can have with some of your great customers that you bid on to be able to come through for them in a time like this. And she was excited. So what we did at the end of the call is we developed then as she's talking to customers and prospects, what, she, what you'll find, most of us will find, is that our customers and prospects are kind of in the same sandbox generally. I mean, they generally have the same set of problems. Some problems you can't solve, some of them you can but what now she's get, she's putting together an email, just a very concise email and a short video that she's filming on her iPhone around, hey, are you running into this problem right now? Is this what you're facing? This is what I'm doing to help clients. And she's sending that out, not only to all five of those, but her entire pipeline in the past, her pipeline in the future and her other prospects. And she called me this morning before this call and she's got some real stuff on the line, things that she never thought that, that could come up today. So again, this is really focused on, on the sales, but here's, here's what I have found in 2000, 2010 through companies and, to, and even now, and it's this, in good times and especially in bad times, price is less of an issue than your ability to solve a problem. The ability to call your customers and solve a problem, it's, it, price is usually never an issue. Cool? And then the third, I will share this, and then we'll, we'll kind of get to some questions. I want to share after this, I want to share some kind of some about 10 or 12 quick tips. This one is a little bit more controversial, and you kind of think about it if you have a sales team or looking at your products and services. Now, before I say it, 
I'm going to tell you that I'm a big promoter of developing people. And I've always said, whether it's a keynote speech or conference or anything, if you want to grow market share, grow your people. So I'm a big people developer from that standpoint. But the third strategy is this is your time to think about enhancing the value of your products and services and your sales team to really start to upgrade the time. And I saw organizations be able to find some, some really good revenue right away from this. There's a time right now, uh, mo most of your competitors are doing is they're thinking about cutting their price. If you wanna find more revenue, one of the ways this seems kind of obvious, but couldn't you possibly raise your price? Is this the time to possibly be the voice of confidence? In 1973, as interesting in the recession then, IBM was famous uh, for, some of you might remember, uh, IBM was famous for raising all of their prices in the 1973 recession. And what they said, and if you probably heard this, this is where the famous saying of no one ever gets fired for hiring IBM. That's where that came from. They raised their prices. And what they did is they created more value for their clients at that particular time. And in 2001, Amazon did the same thing when the dot-com bust they were able at that time while their competitors were trying to cut prices and figure out how to operate what they were doing. That's when they launched their third party selling platform at that time in the midst of that recession, which is obviously what helped make them what they are today. So there is time where you can create more value and you can charge more. There's companies out there. You might be able to, as an example, <coughs> be able to raise your prices and possibly offer more value, like throw in extended warranties, maybe extended terms, things that don't cost a lot. I mean, there's all sorts of opportunities to do those types of things and raise your revenue and grow that revenue against your competitors, that type of thing. Make the switching process easier, I think is really important. And then as I mentioned, this is a time, folks, to really think about your sales teams. Then think about, uh, do you have the ability to pick up good revenue? Do you have the people to be able to do that? Again, I know that, um, again, we care about our people and we wanna make sure that we do the right thing. But what I find in organizations, a lot of times now that I go into, you have about a third of your sales staff, the bottom third, the average barely covers their cost. If they can't sell during bad time or good times, they're not gonna sell during good or bad times. And right now there's a lot of great talent out there that's not only wanting a place to work, but they're also wanting some type of stability. And so there's an opportunity that's happened in 2000, it happened in 2008. There's a huge opportunity for you to upgrade your sales staff and bring those people in, you can find some fast revenue. Usually the middle third, usually what the average will cover about 20 to 30% above their cost and the top, you know, the top third would get anywhere from 60 to 90% by and large. So kind of think about this. The strategy that I want to leave you with when it talks about upgrading your staff is that focus on this. Most businesses in a recession will focus on a, a calling 100 prospects two or three times. This is not the time to do this. This is the time to find out what your target is and focus on calling 10 or 12 of your highest prospects 10 or 12 times. And from that, if you combine these three together, increasing the vi visibility, you know, putting that filter out there, you know, to make sure that you understand what problem you can solve that's different than yesterday, you're looking at your pipeline for leakage, and then you're engaging and you're upgrading and possibly uh, raising your prices, you will find revenue. This is what organizations did, and they positioned themselves for greatness. So... So those are kind of the three strategies I leave. And again, I know we've got a diverse group of people, so those don't fit all. I wanted to share a couple other just quick ideas. And then Sally, let's open it up for questions here in a minute. Uh, there's, there's obvious uh, ones out there that, that you have. Uh, Craig Lohman at Lohman Companies just reminded us, and this is a good, uh, there's the Paycheck uh, Protection Act. That is a way, again, uh, for us to look at. You need to go through, it's my understanding, through your own bank to be able to ask about those and through those terms, but that information is out there online. And I think Sally, you've been forwarding that stuff out to business members anyways, but that is something that is out there for you right now to 
uh, be able to garner some revenue. So the three strategies I talked about were more around sales. These are just kind of quick hits. We also know that uh, you have the ability to cut expenses. You can sell idle assets. You can extend payables. You can change your trade terms. You can reposition and leverage, re-leverage your balance sheet. Those are all strategies to gain cash, and a lot of businesses uh, are looking to try to do that. Here's one that I want to I want to make a. Uh, this is one of the most powerful. Uh, Bob Nelson said there was four. I think I had three, but here. So Bob, here's the here's the fourth for you is that one of the things that you can find additional revenue right away is leverage your connections. This is the time to go to your friends. This is the time to go to the people that you've been connected to and have a real good conversation around the problems that they're having and the problems that you're having. And you'd be amazed at what can come out of this. When, you're, when you have your sales people talking to your prospects and customers about the problems, what you wanna do is get them together and try to figure out what are the common threads that you hear, can hear. You can do that with your connections as well. One of the most powerful connections that I have and that we all have and we're probably not aware is our, is our Mesa Chamber of Commerce. I mean, when you think about Mesa Chamber, this is the value in, in this, and I've seen this in good times and bad, but being able to go in and be able to call them, they know how everybody's hurting. They know the problems are out there. They're fielding the calls on and on. This is the time to be able to call and say, Sally or Bob or someone, this is the problem that I'm facing. And they might know somebody. They might know somebody. So think about that and using those connections. Uh, be online and be visible. I think those are really important. You see us doing that today. This is the time your customers need to hear from you because we can't frankly do it face to face. But being able to put little blurbs and things like that are powerful, powerful things. So Sally, I've been going for a while, kind of fast here. Um, why don't we turn it over uh, for questions and kind of let everybody, you know, after that and how their business will look different and, and shine different. And that's what you see coming out of these recessions, uh, businesses that are able to do that. Hey, uh, Larry, I have a question for you. Um, so those conversations, you know, when you do those, those outreaches, talk a little bit about how to initiate those conversations in a consultative way instead of because you don't want people to get your phone call and think oh my god they're calling me to sell something yeah so throw a couple of ideas on on how to initiate that discussion and initiate that dialogue yeah that's great um you know one of the things that i used to talk a lot when we were when we were rebuilding markets and growing them was really to come at it from an authentic place so that first and foremost get your sales team in an authentic problem solving place. This is not the time to feel like you have to sell something, you know, and really push something because really at the end, you almost have a look of desperation. We see that in emails that we're getting and people that are calling on us. Now, what you really want to do is you want to position it as I'm here to help. I don't know how all the answers, so to speak, but, but what are the problem that you're facing? So Bob, to your, to your question, simply having somebody reach out and say, look, I realize we're all hurting, but I wanted to reach out and find out what are the one or two, maybe three initiatives that are important to you right now, or what problem are you trying to solve, you know, that you did before, or we had looked at something before and that didn't work. What do you, what are you focused on right now? Because what you'll, what you'll see, just like Keith's example, and again, it happens with all sorts of businesses is that you can't solve everybody's problems. There's some things you just can't solve, but at the end of the day, you may be able to find yourself as a solution. So the other part of that is you just listen. And what I found a lot of benefit, even in my organization where I was at, is I would then pool the salespeople together once a day or even once a week and be able to say, what are you hearing out there for the customers, right? What, what are the customers and prospects telling us what problem are they facing? And then let your team brainstorm ideas. It's amazing what your team will come up with. And then now you're going back to them with a solution that is all about them, not about what you sell, which is the way sales should be anyways. It should always be about what you're doing to benefit the end user. And that's what in my business now I'm trying to take back. So it's positioning them, Bob. Yeah. Hey, Larry, you talked about saving your current customers by being in contact and solving different problems. How do you keep them and maintain the price when competitors are cutting theirs? 
Yeah, so I, I, I saw this a lot in the, in the, in the industries, a lot of companies. So, you, so you're out there, right? And we're trying to go out and we're talking about value and extended warranties or, or some type of value add. Maybe we're thinking about raising our prices or keeping our price. And of course, you've got the, 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 the people that their strategy is to go out and cut the price, right? I'm just going to slash it. One of the things that I, uh, that I consult with clients, and, and I'll give you this because I've been doing this myself in all of my businesses for 15, 16 years now. What I do, Sally, is, is a very simple strategy to avoid being picked off is that I give all customers, uh, the top customers, a value added scorecard at the end of the year. Or if it's something that's renewing on whenever the renewal is, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And it's a one page document at the end of the year that literally just says to them, here's the things that I completed for you. It's not a matter of, oh, I took this phone call on June 2nd. That's not what we're talking about. But we all know that we have customers that we create a lot of value for, but sometimes we can be so good at it that the customer doesn't always see it. So I'll give you a quick example. I love stories. So <laughs> I, move, I, move, I move out to Arizona and uh, I, so I got to get a pest company, right? So I hire a pest company to come and spray, spray my house that I had bought. And the next day it was like bug Armageddon. I, I, I know that's gross, but I literally had to sweep up bugs because the house had been idle for a while. And so the next week they come back and they, they spray or next month they come back and spray and there's less bugs and then there's none, right? After three months. Now, these people do a good job on a number of issues, a uh, number of things and whatnot. And I have people knock on my doors all the time. Boom, boom, boom. You know, we can cut your aid. What do you pay now? We'll slash it. And then we do this immersion technique and they got all this stuff, right? But I'm loyal to this pest company for three or four years. <clears throat> the reason I tell you this story is because that pest company does such a great job that you don't see any bugs. You don't see the problem. And so one of the things that I have always done is you have to think about your top 20 customers or 20% of your customers, and you have to give them a value added scorecard, something that tells them, Hey, <clears throat> here's the things that I did for you over the last year. Here's the value I provided. So I'll give a plug. I see Keith and Peggy Lawson are on Keith. You were just talking, but Keith does a lot of my printing, printing work in my business. I have to print a lot of brochures. Well, I come across an event this last fall that, Clearly, I didn't know I needed something. And then when I did, I called Keith and said, Keith, can you help me out? And Keith reallocated, market builder, he reallocated resources to get that deal done for me in the quality that Keith expects of his products. It was phenomenal. <laughs> but the reason why I tell that story is sometimes we can forget that, can't we, Sally? We can kind of forget, you know, the, that somebody's done a really good job. And if Keith, now I may not be a top 20 customer, but nevertheless, having a one page sheet to be able to say, look, here's the projects that we did for you this year. And here's the deal that we turned around in three hours and, or, you know, in three days or whatever. And then at the bottom, I usually just put a little solicitation. Tell me how I can get better. Tell me how I can produce more value and have them send that in. And I do that all the time because right now I know this is a long answer, but this is really powerful for all of you on the phone because at the end of the day, when those people are calling saying, I can cut your rate, they're going to look and remember that sheet that you give them every year. And they're going to go, nah, I I'm good with what I got. So that helps. Nice. Are, are these strategies designed to help us with the next recession then? <clears throat> yes. I have another one, right? Yeah. So one of the things that we could do, Sally, if there was, if there was, uh, if, if there's interest and in people like this type of format, one of the things I think we could do another Zoom call in a couple months or maybe we, or three months, whenever, when we start to crest out of this. And one of the things I have on my mind and what I'm talking to businesses about now is not only growing the revenue, which we always have to be doing, high, growing high margin revenue and producing value at every step of the way. That's the goal. But then it's the decisions that you make of how you stress test your business how you're able to take that income or that profitability or that new revenue and how do you improve your balance sheet? How do you improve your liquidity, re reduce your debt? How do you, uh, how do you focus on how much variable interest rate versus, versus fixed interest rate? How, how do you position yourself so that, I, I know this one's a little unique, but a recession, you become more of a bystander in it and it gives you the ability to capitalize on those opportunities. And so, yes, they work for, for future, but they really work on helping you to position so that the sting isn't so bad. 
I mean, let's be honest, this is a different type of crisis. This came <coughs> here, right? Versus the last three have kind of worked themselves into it. But yeah. 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 Hey, uh, Larry, we've got a question in the chat, so I'm going to kind of relay that to you if you've got a second. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So one of our uh, attendees basically said, hey, we have a restaurant, and we're not set up for takeout. Um, they've laid off the staff for now. Do you have any suggestions for them? Yeah, so so um, there's businesses out there that um, uh, you know they're they're in all shapes uh, of this situation, and and restaurants have we as we all know have been hit, and we're trying to support that. And um, you know what will come from that for that business? You know they may start to reinvent themselves. But uh, just ironically, I, I forget the name, and I wish I could give them a plug, which would be beneficial. But um, I just saw on the news that a restaurant in Phoenix was now doing grocery bags. So what they were doing, they had to lay off all their staff and this is just an idea, but what they were doing is they were packaging some of the meals and some of the inventory, the food inventory that they had, and they were putting those into almost like a grocery bag for delivery and they were delivering those to people. So the, the and, and charging for them, of course, but then they were able to get some supplies if they wanted a loaf of, let's say French bread, maybe some wine or whatever that would happen to be, but then they could also have a couple cooked meals in there from that restaurant and that was a way in which according to the news feed they were kind of just trying to stay afloat at this time so when you're not set up for it and you don't have customers coming in i guess my 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 general answer is we have to go to them we have to find ways to go to them and that was just a way that was on the news the other night can you so, talk at the end, you know, I'd like to give my contact information so that if somebody has a direct question on their Absolutely. business, they can sure reach out to me. Yeah. You want to do that now, just in case somebody yeah, has to jump okay. off? Individuals can reach, uh, so boilingfrogdevelopment.com is my website. So boilingfrogdevelopment.com. It was based off the parable of the boiling frog. <laughs> Businesses recognize their environment has changed, and who would have thought it could be more relevant today? Yeah, no kidding. You can email me personally. My direct uh, email is boilingfrogdevelopment at gmail.com. And Great. then I change more of the cell phone number, my direct line, but that's an easy way. Facebook too. So, yeah. I, I did have one, um, one other question. If you could talk about maybe the characteristics of leaders that thrive versus some that just survive during crises like we're going through. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good question. So I accumulated, I took the opportunity to interview thousands of business owners over an 18 year span you know, what makes some difference between thriving and surviving. And, and, and then there's many things and that's kind of the world I'm in now, but I'll give you one and it's a little philosophical. So just stay with me. But <laughs> one of the biggest differences <clears throat> that I found overall between business owners that thrive versus survive is that some had a can attitude and some had a cannot. And I know that's overly philosophical and it doesn't maybe do maybe, but you have to realize that we can do this. I mean, we can survive this. We have to innovate ourselves and we have to be open to it. Typically, when I sit across from a business owner and you're giving them ideas on development or you're giving them ideas on how they can do something different or how they position within their target market, if I'm getting a lot of can'ts, more than likely you can't do a whole lot with them. And those are the individuals that either just survive or don't survive. But the ones that sit there and say, look, what this guy or gal is saying isn't necessarily applicable to me, but it does give me a different thought on something. Those are the people that by and large was a characteristic of those that thrived. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. Thank you. Yeah. I think there were a couple of other questions. Um, Kevin Frost, did you have a question? The question that I had was more the, uh, the, the four main, um, the point of the, the Zoom meeting today was the, the four top things, and I was just trying to specifically label them all out with yeah. the top four. No, I'll give, I'll give, Kevin, I'll give you just a, a good recap. So the, so, the, so the first is increasing your visibility with customers, prospects, and 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 team, I kind of left off team, but if you have a team, this is the time when productivity is down and reaching out to them and communication is very key. The second is to review your pipeline for leakage. That is to be able to go in and find out where you're losing deals or where you've lost deals in the past and find those. And then the third is to enhance the value of your products 
and your services. So this is upgrade your prices. And the fourth that I threw in, I think that is extremely powerful in good and bad is to leverage your closest connections, leverage your closest connections. The people that are friends, business associates, things of that nature is one of the most powerful things and talk to each other about solutions. You'll find some really cool, Kevin, you'll find some really, when you do that, you'll find some really good collaborative ideas between people that maybe don't have like businesses. I've even seen examples where people have joined up with competitors, you know, to be able to try to make it through. I mean, there's, there's opportunities there. So those are the four. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions? Um, I'll leave you with, I'll leave my part with this as we're kind of wrapping up. Um, think about these things. Now, again, there's, 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 I, I rattled off a list of other ways that you can raise revenue and you can find revenue. But at the end of the day, we can survive this. We have the opportunity to be able to do this if we have the right attitude and we're out and about. What most companies that didn't really survive through 2008 that I witnessed by and large are the ones that stuck their heads in the sand. And just kind of said, I'm going to hunker down. I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to slash expenses. I'm just going to sit there. Those people never grew to be the company that they were before, by and large. And so this is an opportunity if we're going out and we're talking or increasing our visibility that we can do it. We can find revenue right away. We can solve problems. But more than ever, more than ever, I can tell you this. And like almost everybody on the phone, my business will not, my personally will not be the same as it was two months ago. It just will not. And the only way I can reinvent in the right way is if I'm out talking to the people and trying to solve problems for them. And at the end of the day, I'll reinvent into something that's more beautiful than it was before. And you can do it too. Cool. Awesome. Yeah.